this morning, praise God. Shouldn't everything that we're about this morning seek to honor and praise the one who is the giver of life, the one who offers eternal life, the one who offers abundant life? Let me encourage you this morning to open your Bibles to the book of Job. If you've been reading your Bible through in a year, uh, you've either in the book of Job or you've just finished it. And boy, when you read that particular book in the Old Testament, you get a lot of great truths about life. Life is my, not a byproduct of what you deserve. The reality is that bad things happen to good people all the time. And so often we ask the question, what did I do to deserve this? And then in the midst of that turmoil, in the midst of that strife, or in the midst of that darkness, we pray and pray and pray. God just seems to be silent. There seems to be no answer to the prayer that's pouring forth from our heart. This past Wednesday, we assembled for our weekly staff meeting. We usually do so on Tuesday, but I was in Jackson at a meeting, so we just delayed it a day. And as we had begun our meeting, David got a text from a fellow youth pastor, Jason Morrow, who serves at First Baptist Church of Columbus, a great church. They do a wonderful job and wonderful work there. And the text simply said that he was taking his daughter, Eliza, to the hospital, that she had had a seizure and had gotten sick. And David said, I think I probably need to go to the hospital and check on them. Four years old. And so David leaves and we continue on and we go through our prayer time and of course we pray specifically for this little four-year-old girl. Little did we know that she had one seizure, then she had a second seizure, then she had a third seizure that ultimately took her life. And so as we're there in that meeting, a text comes back to me from David that says, Eliza's gone to be with Jesus. And you just stare at it for a second. And you say, how can this be? Where is the justice in this? If we're going to select somebody to leave this earth, I've got several that I can nominate. There's several people that probably would deserve to go before her. And so we go on with our meeting, and then later on David comes in, and he sits down in my office, and he pours out his heart and just says, it's hard to accept. How? Can something like this take place? You ever ask that question? You ever had those thoughts run through your mind? Quite possibly something's happened in your life and you kind of feel as though the Lord's dealt you a tough hand to play. We pray and pray and pray and heaven seems to be made of brass. Our words seem to echo off of the walls of Jerusalem coming down, resounding around our ear. God is silent. Let's see if we can find something from the Old Testament and something from the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I don't believe I've ever preached on this passage in the New Testament when it wasn't around Easter. 
just kind of relegated this passage of Scripture to Easter time, but it's a time that we need to examine it today to see how it speaks to our hearts. If you're physically able, let's stand as we look at Job chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. Then Job replied, Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If I only knew where to find him, if I could only go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out how, uh, what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There an upright can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. Now let's look in the gospel according to Mark. Mark the 15th chapter. Verses 21 through 27. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. And he was forced, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And in the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he is calling Elijah. One man ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes and takes him down, he says. This is the word of God. The people of God, may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word and all God's people together said, you may be seated. I wish that I could tell you that your life is always going to be filled with happiness and joy. It'd be nice to know that you're not going to have any difficulties. You're never going to face any disappointments. You'll, you'll never have any frustrations and and your heart is never going to be broken. But that's just not simply life. It's not reality. That's fantasy land. That's Disney World. It's a place that you might visit for a while, but nobody resides there. Christianity is not an insurance policy that protects us from all of life's pain and sorrow. There are some preachers out there that are, are making a good living and drawing tremendous crowds by preaching a name it, claim it gospel. And they're saying, you know, God wants to prosper you. And if you think positive thoughts and just believe, your life is going to be filled with happiness and joy. That's a devil's lie. That is a devil's lie. The reality of the matter is... Difficult times come to all of us. We're all going to experience dark days. Some of us are going to experience more than others. Some of you have known or will know the pain of cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, body just drained from the treatment. There are some of you that are going to know the heartache and the grief of a rebellious child. 
child that you have nurtured, a child that you have loved and, and given every opportunity to succeed in life. And rather than that child really grasping hold of everything that you've taught him or her, you see them turn and live a life of which you are not familiar. And your heart will be broken. Some of you are going to know, or all of us are going to know, what it's like to lose a loved one. A father, a mother, or a child. This week, in just the blink of an eye, in less than a second, your life can change. And all the joy and all the happiness that you have known can now be centered around a hospital room and uncertainty. For you see, I've told you before that there are three types of people in this world. There are those in a storm, there are those coming out of a storm, and those about to go through a storm. Look at all the darkness that exists in our world today. We live in a land of plenty, but there's still famine. There are people that are going to bed at night that are hungry. There are individuals that are are living in poverty, not because they're lazy, but because of the circumstances that have surrounded their lives. Various diseases rack and tear lives apart. We have homeless people that are living right here, just a mile or two away from us. Our world seems to be torn apart with natural disasters. Turn on the television set. And look and see what's going on in Texas. As we see this hurricane force storm known as Harvey dumping inches and feet of water in Houston, Texas and the surrounding area. Earthquakes. The threat of terrorism and war constantly haunts us. Violent crimes in the street. Three shootings the other night. In Starkville, in Octibaha County, one individual taking another person's life for the second time, and he's only 16 years of age. And we look at all of this stuff that's taking place in our lives, and in our world, in our society, in our town. We say, why is God silent? Why isn't he doing something about this? Why do we have all of this suffering in the world? Well, before you can answer that question, I think you've got to go back over 2,000 years ago in a time where God possibly was the most silent. It was a place that you and I know as Golgotha. As our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ is hanging spread eagle on a cross, bearing your sins and my sins in his body. He cries out with the loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you silent? Look throughout the life of Jesus, and he had always walked in harmony with the Father. As a matter of fact, he said, apart from the Father, the Son can do nothing. If you want to see the Father, look at me. And now, as he is hanging on the cross in his hour of need, he is crying out, God, why don't you answer my plea? Why are you silent? But those are your words. And those are mine. And those are the words of many across our world. Why aren't you answering? Matthew and Mark were the only Gospels to record these words. Mark being probably the original of, or the first of all of the Gospels. Matthew probably the second. Both of them record these unique words that our Lord spoke. But was it a cry of delirium? When you think about it, a cry of delirium, a 
cry of pain and agony. Haven't there been moments in your life when you've had this physical pain? Whether it has been from an accident, whether it has been from a medical treatment, that you have said, Lord, do something about the pain. The American Medical Association published an article on the physical death of Jesus and all that he suffered at the hands of the Roman government. All the pain that he endured. There is no denying that he was physically hurting as he hung on that cross, but his death was relatively quick. Six hours. We are told from history that when individuals were crucified on a cross, that they might hang on that cross for a day or two before they died because they would die from suffocation. So when you think about the term of his hanging there on that cross, the time frame, it was relatively short. But there was a difference. What made that death so agonizing, so painful was while he is hanging on the cross, he is bearing your sins and my sins in his body, in the sins of the world. Maybe it was a cry of doubt. Had he doubted his calling? How could this be happening at this time? Have you ever gotten to a point and place in your life where you've asked, so it all boils down to this? Is this it? I remember when I resigned from my last church. And I cleaned out my office. All the boxes were in my truck. Everything that had been there, that had been my possession, is now cleaned out. And I sat behind that desk for about 30 minutes thinking, well, it's all just come to this. Well, where are we going now? That might be the question you're asking about your life. It's all boiled down to this. Is this all there is to life? One frustration, one disappointment, one heartache after another. It could have been a cry of depression or desertion. You see, on that cross, Jesus is in complete isolation. Where were his disciples? His own family thought that he was insane. I mean, think about it. Where were they? He had the inner three, didn't he? And then he had 12 disciples. Now well, let's kind of count them down a little bit. Judas has already hung himself, so we're down to what? 11. Of the 11, you got the inner three. Peter, James, and what? And who? John. Okay? So you got 11 left. You've got three of your closest friends, Peter, James, John. Let's, let's just look at Peter for a moment. Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Jesus had allowed him to walk on water. He had already denied him in the courtyard of Caiaphas. Nowhere to be found. Where was James? Where was he? Only one was there. John, from 11 to 3, down to 1. You can find out who your friends are when you're at your lowest point in life. <laughs> when you are the life of the party, when you're buying all the drinks, when everybody is, your, you know, everybody wants to be your friend then. But then you start hitting rock bottom. Where are all the friends? You know, last night, we had supposedly one of the greatest fights of all time, baloney. We
we had one of the greatest con fights of all time last night. You want to see a real fight? Go YouTube Ali Frazier, Madison Square Garden, around 1971. That was a real fight. What you had last night wasn't. Floyd Mayweather got a cabillion dollars for that fight. He bet in six figures on himself in that fight. They wouldn't allow him to bet, so he had his people bet for him. I mean, I'm not telling you something that you don't know. But one of the things that I watched last, uh, oh, I think it was Thursday evening when they had the weigh-in. And I, and, I, and I said something to Tommy Joe about this. She got interested in this. I thought she was going to buy the fight last night. I mean, she's watching this weigh-in. And have you ever noticed the entourage of these guys? Does that ever stick out to you? I mean, here is supposedly the greatest fighter in the world. Surrounded by bodyguards. Isn't that kind of an oxymoron? I mean, I understand you got folks out there going to take their shots, but, you know, we, we sometimes see these famous folks, and the minute they get famous, what happens? People have come and attach to them like leeches. And you know what they do? Same thing happened in Elvis's life. They drain them dry because everybody's got what? Their hand out. Everybody wants something, don't they? And so when you're the life of the party and you're leaving a $1,000 tip, everybody's going to be your friend. Everybody's going to love you. But when you make a few bad investments and the money starts running dry and all of a sudden you have no resources to start divvying out, you find out who your friends are. And here's Jesus, wondering, weren't there 12? Was it a cry of dereliction? Total abandonment of God. As one scholar suggested, God forsaking God. Who can imagine? A cry of absolute isolation. A derelict ship is a ship with no passengers. A derelict ship is a ship with no crew. A derelict ship is a ship with no captain. A derelict ship is a ship with no hope. But this is what I think it was. And I want you to hear this because now we start making a little bit of sense out of all of this. This was a cry of identification. You see, at the cross, Jesus identifies with us and feels our suffering. You see, today, no matter what you're going through, no matter how dark the night or how great the isolation, or how deep the depression, or how much the pain, or how great the sorrow, he's felt it. And though the world does not understand, and though the world cannot say, I get it, he gets it. Those around the cross began to say, you know, he's calling for Elijah, because Eloi could have been translated Elijah. Or mistaken for Elijah. And here they are. They're, they're giving him wine mixed with myrrh. And they're putting it on a reed. And putting that sponge up to his mouth. To allow him to take something in. But right here he is experiencing the silence of God. In this sacred moment. Can we just be honest and transparent. Because if there's any place that we ought to be able to be honest, it should be in church. Because God already knows our hearts. And he knows what you're thinking right now. So let's kind of forget that we got a crowd. Have you ever asked the question, 
Why? Why is this happening? If your answer is yes, then congratulations. It means you're normal. Or as normal as some of you can be. For some of you, normal and your name don't collide a lot in sentence. But it does make you normal. I have stood by some of the most devout Christians who have ever walked the face of this earth. And in the midst of pain and sorrow and grief and distress... They have asked me why. I have held lifeless babies in my hand. I have stood by the bedside of the brokenhearted. I have held my Bible in hand and quoted scripture at countless graves. In pain is a reality in life. Tuesday when I was coming back from Jackson, I have a regular detour now. It's a detour through Canton, Mississippi to go see my dear friend whose husband took his life back in June. It's not a detour that I look forward to I look forward to seeing her but it is it's hard and the reason it's hard because I have people that will ask me all the time how's she doing and I look at them and say she's doing terrible she's doing awful what do you expect and I walk into her office and I usually try to surprise her I don't tell her I'm coming Make sure that nobody in the office tells her when I walk in, I do this to everybody so I can walk to her desk. And when she sees me, she comes and gives me my hug. And then we go back to the back room and we talk. And the only thing that she does is cry. Because the pain is overwhelming. And it's unending. And she never gets away from it. And the other day she said, all I want to know is why. why. Why did this happen? I think I could have some closure if I only knew why. Martin Marty, in his book, A Cry of Absence, that he wrote following the death of his wife, he said, you know, in my moment of brokenness, in my time of heartache, I, I went to the book of Psalms. And he said, only to find that about half of the Psalms are laments. They're songs from the people that are singing, God, where are you? You don't believe me? Open up the book of Psalms sometime and just kind of thumb through. Where are you, Lord? Why do you hide your face from me? And this is what takes place. Oftentimes, when we go through a difficult situation, and we feel as though God has been silent to our request, we reject God altogether. And we get mad at God. And our anger begins to boil up. And listen, folks. You can get angry with God. Yeah, you can. I have to take tell Brittany you can. You can get angry with God. The Bible says be angry but don't sin. We somehow think that our anger offends God. No. He's quite big and quite strong enough to handle anything you can dish at. And so, direct your anger at him. Don't direct it at the folks who are the innocent. So find out who you're really angry with. Hugh Walpole, in one of his novels, 
is talking about all, he has a character that's talking about all the suffering in life. And he turns to his friend, Vanessa, and says, Vanessa, you know in your heart of hearts there is no God. How can there be a God in the world be as it is? You ever had anybody ask you that? If there's a God, why is there so much suffering? If there is a God, why is there so much cancer? If there is a God, why does a four-year-old child die? If there is a God... Why do we have this storm hitting? If there is a God, why do we have a hurricane that hits a place or an earthquake that hits a place like Haiti and kills hundreds of thousands of people? Listen closely. You and I cannot be complete individuals without the possibility of suffering. You can't. You cannot truly be the person or a complete person without the possibility of suffering. I mean, what does good health mean if there's not the possibility of your health being taken from you without the possibility of disease? If there was no disease, then we would never know the blessing of having good health. What would courage mean if there wasn't the possibility of being a coward? What does forgiveness mean if there's not the potential of sinfulness? What does hope mean if there is not the possibility of hopelessness? What does faith mean without the possibility of doubt? See, I'm convinced without the possibility of suffering and pain, growth and maturity is not possible. I grow as a Christian more through those dark times than I ever do as I'm walking in the light. The problem is we don't recognize it while we're in it. It's only after we come out of it. Wallace Hamilton tells a story about how they were vacationing in the mountains one year and uh, he had his wife and his mother-in-law and four-year-old boy John and said the, the, the girls decided to go to this town to do a little shopping so Dr. Wallace was left there with this four-year-old son John they were in the backyard of the little cabin where they were staying and he started watching John and John started wandering off and so Dr. Hamilton said I'm just gonna see how far he goes so there's a little wooded area back behind the cabin John just starts wondering, and Dr. Hamilton stayed at a distance where John couldn't see him, but he could see John. And John walked for about three quarters of a mile into that thicket of woods. And then he stopped, and he looked here, imagine a four-year-old, looked here, and he looked there, and he started crying. Why was he crying? Huh? He was lost. And so Dr. Hamilton said, John, do you want to go home? Finally, he realized his dad was there. He says, yes, Daddy, but John is lost. Dr. Hamilton said, many times after that experience, he was reminded of those moments in his life when he got lost, either by carelessness or by choice in his own life. And God would come and say, I'm here. God gives us the freedom today for good or to do evil, to choose right or choose wrong. His way or our way we could never really be fully human without the freedom of choice we have to obey the natural laws of the universe at the cross you and I discover that God gives us the same answer in silence that he gave Jesus at Golgotha sometimes silence I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, and I'm going to say it in a way that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay? 
we know less about Jesus than more about Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? We know less about this man than we really know about him. Y'all got that deer in the headlight look right now. Let me explain it. He's born in Bethlehem. Greeted by shepherds. Pretty much, we don't hear anything about age one or age two, do we? The next time that we hear about Jesus is when the Magi come to the house where he is. They weren't there on Christmas Eve. Stop putting them in the nativity scene. They weren't there. He's a child. And then from that moment on, we have a gap till age 12 when his parents take him to the temple. Oh, we don't know anything for 10 years about what his life was about, what he did, where he went, what type of child he was. Then he goes to the temple with his parents. You remember they start caravanning home, realize he's not with them, double back. He's worried us to death, and he says what? I must be about my father's business. Okay, that's at age 12. You know the next time we hear about him? At age 30. That's an 18-year gap. And his ministry lasted about three years. We know less about this man than we know more about this man. But this man knows more about us. And what we do know about him is enough. I don't have to know about his childhood. I don't have to know about his adolescent years. I would imagine there were moments when his mother wanted to pin his ears back. I don't need to know about his early life. Let me tell you something. Those last three years made the difference not only in my life and the lives of millions of others. But there's a veil of silence throughout his life. When he stands before Pilate and Pilate says, I have the opportunity to, re to release you or condemn you. He stood there silent. But on the cross, he prays out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what does all this silence mean? Most important part of the sermon. Rather than an explanation, God gives us a presence. I'm not sure any man suffered as much as Job did. Physical man. I mean, read that book and look at what all happened to him. Talking about a bad lot in life. But Job found out there was no simple answers. And listen to me, folks. Let's stop trying to explain God in religious cliches. Okay, let's just understand that his ways are beyond our ways. Suffering is not a punishment for sin. You may suffer as a result of your sin, but that was your choice. God doesn't deliberately punish us for doing wrong. But he is present with us in the storms of life as well as in the good days. Because nothing separates us from the love of God. L.D. Johnson's daughter was killed on an icy highway at the age of 23. And he struggled with her death and he penned these words. For the Christian, there is an answer but not an explanation. There is an answer to every prayer that you pray. There is not an explanation. Do you know why? God does not owe you an explanation. 
You are not God. He is God alone. And he was here as that song we sang, before time began. So when you say he owes you, he doesn't owe you jack. But you owe him everything. And he's not going to have to defend himself to you. But he doesn't abandon us in our time of hurt. He shares in it. And he gives us a presence. There are moments in life when it's hard to hear him. But that doesn't mean he's moved. It might be that you've moved away from him and if that's the case draw near draw near he'll give you an answer and the answer will come in his presence would you bow with me As your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, I want you to think for a moment. I want you to think back to when you first became a Christian. Could have been in your childhood. Could have been in your adolescent years. Or as a young adult. But for some it was middle ages for some of you it was in your senior adult years some of you came to know Christ as you listened to the story and from the time that you were in the cradle roll to the time that you became a third grader And it was just a natural progression of hearing and believing. For some, you might have been sitting in a sanctuary similar to this at a revival meeting. And the preacher began to say that there is no life apart from Christ. And you realized that you were sunk. Still for others, somebody might have made it to your house on a cold and rainy evening. And shared with you the love of God. There may be even someone here that was in a hotel thinking about taking their lives and the only thing that saved them was a Gideon's Bible. But remember what it was like when you gave your heart to Christ. Do you remember the excitement? And now the years have worn, the days have gone by, and your heart has grown cold, and doubt, anxiety, despondency, despair, those things have now lodged in your heart. And you begin to pray, Lord, to my heart, bring back the spring. You can do that today. If you'll just think back to that moment when you said, Jesus, come into my heart. Father, we thank you today for loving us and being present even in your sight. Let us draw closer to you in the darkness. For you are the one who knows how to turn on a light inside a light. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation to allow you to respond to what you've seen, what you've felt, what you've heard here this morning. Maybe this morning you come giving your heart to Christ. Maybe you come rededicating your life or transferring a church membership.
any decision you feel the Lord asking you to make, we would encourage you to do that. Maybe, just maybe, you might need to come to the altar and pray about something that's going on in your life, or maybe you want somebody else to pray with you. We always have folks that are pretty good at prayer around here. There may be somebody here that led you to the Lord, and you might just need to go say, thank you, I appreciate you. Any decision you feel God asking to make you do that as we stand and prayerfully sing together. Thank you.